Before I share the message, I'd like to just share a very short reading from the Bible. And this is a reading that is uh, often shared on Remembrance Day Sunday. It's from the Gospel of John. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. It says in the book of Psalms, in the Bible, Psalm 90 to be exact, that a truly lucky person will enjoy a life of three score years and ten. A particularly lucky or strong person will enjoy a life of four score. A score is 20 years, meaning, according to biblical times, a lucky person lives to be 70 years old, and a really lucky person will live to be 80. Now today, I think we put those numbers a little bit higher. We might say that a lucky person lives to be 90, and a really lucky person lives to be 100 or more. But I was thinking about what that means today in terms of Remembrance Day. As we mark today the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II, it means that for people in the Western world, we have enjoyed an entire lifetime without having to deal with a catastrophic war such as we saw in the early 20th century. It doesn't mean that Canadian soldiers haven't been involved in other wars and conflicts around the world, but it does mean that we have enjoyed in this country a full lifetime of peace. And if you look back in history, that is almost unprecedented for any nation. Sadly, war has been a part of the fabric of humanity forever. As one historian put it, the history of the world is not of a peaceful world that is sometimes at war, but a warring world that sometimes enjoys peace. Rarely has an entire generation lived through peaceful times. I wonder if that's why some have called the struggle with COVID as kind of a version of our generation's war. For the vast, vast majority of us, my generation and probably your generation, you've never had to deal with a situation that in some ways parallels war. Meaning, a situation beyond our control that changes how we interact, that affects our everyday life, that calls upon us to make sacrifices, that destabilizes the global community, that induces an ongoing sense of fear or uncertainty. And COVID has done that. Now, don't get me wrong. COVID-19 is not a war. It's not even close. And to ever compare it to World War I or World War II diminishes the experiences of those who went through those conflicts as soldiers or as civilians. But in many ways, you could say that it is our defining struggle, meaning it is the closest that most of us have ever been and hopefully ever will be to understanding the trauma of a global situation that ferments unrest and destabilizes life. I also think for a lot of people that COVID-19 did for us something else that war often does. It bursts a bubble of invincibility. Sure, people like Bill Gates may have predicted a global pandemic years ago, but how many of us ever thought that it would come to pass? Sure, we've had SARS and swine flu and the bird flu, but our experts always knew how to get a handle on those things. So we thought the same would be true of COVID. I remember back in February talking to someone in this church in the healthcare field, and she asked me, are you worried about the coronavirus? that is happening in China and parts of Europe. And I said, no, not really. And she looked at me in the eyes and she said, well, you should be. But still, I wasn't. Because I'm in the generation that has enjoyed a big chunk of that three score and 15 years of peace. And so I, like so many others, have created that bubble of invincibility around me. It can happen there. It can't happen here. And then when it happened here, that bubble burst. And we got a taste for the first time, at least for most of us, what it means to live with uncertainty, to wonder what tomorrow will bring, to worry for our loved ones and ourselves, and to question what is happening in this wonderful world that we've always taken for granted. This might be the first Remembrance Day in which the haunting notes of the last post speak not just to distant sacrifices, 
but to our own inner trauma and pain. This might be the first year that when we watch a tear roll down the wrinkled face of a veteran standing at attention, we may get it just a little more than we ever did before. So maybe now the bubble has burst, and I know it's burst for some time, we have an opportunity to take a really honest, candid look at our world. Now that we know that we too are subject to destabilizing forces of change, that we don't live on an island of immunity where we can sip our pumpkin spice latte and cheer on our team with no thought to the consequences that others may have to deal with. So now maybe we can open our eyes, grow in awareness, and deepen our compassion to other citizens of planet Earth. Because if there's one thing COVID-19 has taught us, it's that we're all in this together. So, how are we doing as a global community? The ancient biblical prophet imagined a world in which, quote, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Are we any closer to that goal than we were all those years ago? I like to think we are. I'm not always so sure we are. On a day in which we remember the sacrifices of our veterans of old, it's important to remember that for many in this world, war is not a history lesson. It's still a very present reality. Recently, a report came from UNICEF that is quite unnerving. Not only does it recognize and name the many hot spots in the world where war is a reality, but it also references how much warfare has changed over the generations. For most of the history of humanity, war was something that was fought between soldiers. Civilians lived their lives for the most part, far from the battlefields of the professional war makers. Sure, they had to live with the consequences of war, uh, destabilization and poverty, but they didn't have to worry about being caught in the crossfire. That has changed vastly. Most conflicts today are not fought on battlefields, in trenches, or behind lines. They are fought in cities and suburbs, from apartment windows and street corners, where distinctions between combatant and non-combatant quickly melt away. Consider this. For the most part of the history of civilization, civilian casualties were at 1% or less, meaning of 100 people killed in war, 99 were soldiers and one was a civilian. That changed come the 20th century. It climbed from 1% to 5%. It climbed again to 15% during World War I, then to 65% during World War II, meaning that 65% of casualties in that war were civilians. So within a half a century, we went from 1% civilian casualty rate to a 65% civilian casualty rate. Guess where that number stands today? 90%. According to UNICEF, 90% of casualties of modern day wars or skirmishes or conflicts are civilians. Innocent people who don't want war any more than you or I do. They are bearing the brunt of violence in our world today. As a result, there are 60 million displaced people in the world thanks to war a number far greater than even at the end of World War II. When we open our eyes, we realize that much of the world is still a very dangerous place. But still we say, that's there, that's then, it's not here. We don't live under that kind of threat. And we don't. And thank goodness we don't. We are fortunate. But again, COVID has taught us it doesn't mean that we don't live without threats of our own. Does that include the threat of war? The kind of thing that we are remembering today. Could that be in our future? We hope not, but given humanity's track record, how can we ever be sure? For example, did you know what happened on a January day just a few years ago? January 11th, 2007 to be exact, China sent a missile into space and destroyed an old weather station that was floating up there. It hit this piece of space junk at a speed of 32,400 kilometers an hour, blowing it into millions of pieces that are now floating around in orbit. No big deal, you say. 
until you start to think of what else is floating around up there in space. Satellites, including Canadian satellites that give us the ability to use our phones, send and receive information, stay connected to the world, know what our weather's going to be. If an old weather station can be targeted, what else could be targeted? It has prompted the creation of an entire department in the Pentagon that is planning for the possibility of a future war that will be fought in space. A war that would definitely have consequences for the global community, including those of us living in sweet and safe Canada. I don't talk about this stuff to scare anyone or upset anyone, but simply to point out that as much as we want to take for granted all the blessings that we enjoy in this country, we can never do so at the expense of awareness, of vigilance, or of caution. I wonder how many people out there have ever read the Hunger Games uh, books, the trilogy, or seen the movies. It was a group of books written really for teenagers, although I know the adults enjoy them as well. It's about a futuristic world, about people living in a country called Panem. And there's a capital city that's basically lived in a bubble. And the people living in the capital city enjoy all the advantages of life, blissfully unaware that their privilege comes at the hands of millions of people who live in the districts around the capital, churning out the fuel and the food, the resources and the weapons to support them. Everything is great for the people of the capital city until finally the bubble breaks and there's a reckoning for all of their excess. And those in the bubble whose wonderful way of life starts to crumble are left wondering, how come we didn't see this coming? I know this isn't the Hunger Games. The Hunger Games is a story. There are no hordes of people amassing at our borders trying to get in, threatening our way of life. But the book was written as a wake-up call to anybody living with privilege to become aware of the unrest in districts around the bubble in which we live. And those districts can have very different names. They really are anything that threatens our way of life. Climate change, economic hardship, systemic injustice, terrorism, and the one that has already breached our bubble, a global pandemic. These are just some of the districts that sit outside of our bubbled paradise, even if we don't want to see them sitting there. It's why I believe that ignorance is one of the greatest threats to human survival. Bubbles are nice and safe, but when they keep us from seeing things as they really are, or responding to things as they need to be responded to, they serve only to buy us time from the waves of change that inevitably crash upon every shore. And when the waves crash, we wonder why we are suddenly so wet. You know, I'd never think to tell God what to do, but if I could tweak the Ten Commandments a little bit, I would add an Eleventh Commandment, and it would say this, Thou shalt not be ignorant, unaware, or uninformed. Heads are meant for thinking, and problem solving, and communicating. They were not meant to be stuck in the sand. We always need to strive to see things, not just as we wish to see them, but as they already are. Okay, so now you're thoroughly depressed and you're worried about a missile coming and blowing up your link to Facebook. Let's take a deep breath and let me try and turn the sermon around a little bit. My purpose today in removing the bubble in which we live, or that some of us live, and exposing us or making us feel vulnerable is because... I want to talk what I think today is really all about. It is about celebrating freedom. Isn't that what we thank our veterans for and thank our military personnel for today? For sacrificing, even sacrificing their lives so that we can enjoy what? So that we can enjoy freedom. To watch footage, as we did, of those beautiful young men and young women on the fields of battle of yesterday, fighting so that we can enjoy what we have today, can move us all to tears. And time has not diminished the amazing sense of sacrifice. I think that's why, over a hundred years later, this day is just as important, if not more important, than the very first Remembrance Day. As we want to grasp hold of the final threads of that generation, 
that did this for us. We want to keep saying thank you. And what do we say to them? Thank you for the gift of freedom. But what do we actually mean when we say freedom? In a very real and direct sense, we are thanking them for fighting the forces that we believe would have taken those freedoms away. Fighting against fascism, totalitarianism, a dictatorship, those ideologies in the 20th century bent on world do domination and the collapse of civilized society. It didn't take long for it to become clear that the Nazi machine under Hitler had a single goal, to dominate the world with its ideology of Aryan supremacy. And it was prepared to trample on the personal freedoms of anyone to achieve that goal, including its own German citizens, who really were as much a prisoner of this terrifying ideology as the rest of the world. The sacrifice of those soldiers, particularly in the Second World War, gave us freedom from tyranny and freedom to continue to work the work of creating a world order, at least in the West, based on democratic ideas based on fundamental beliefs of justice, equality, human dignity, and fairness. And so we say, thank you for giving us freedom from evil forces to build a basically good society. And we have. At least we have in comparison to the other option had the other side been victorious. But here's where I'm going with this. Freedom is a two-lane street. Each lane has a different name. On one lane, the sign says freedom from. And on the other lane, the sign over it says freedom to. Meaning, one of those lanes means looking back on the faces of our veterans and saying thank you for taking the mantle upon yourself all those years ago so we could have freedom from tyranny. But the other lane means that now we have to pick up that mantle and decide where freedom is going to take us. Freedom to. We have to spend some time on the freedom from land to remember what we have, but then we have to get right back on the freedom to lane and figure out what we're going to do with this gift. Confused? Don't be. We're going to figure this out together. Because this is where I think we squander the freedoms that we were, have been given. Thanks to the sacrifices of the past, we have freedom from. But does that mean we have freedom to do whatever we want. Does that mean we have freedom to live empty, unproductive, self-serving lives? Well, really it does. But in the end, what does that really serve? Let me give you an example. I remember an article I read in paper a couple of years ago, and it was uh, first of November, and someone had put up their Christmas lights and they were glowing for all to see. As the article said, a neighbor of this person had questioned him and suggested maybe as a sign of respect he shouldn't put his lights on until after Remembrance Day. To which the man replied, well, isn't that what those soldiers gave their life for? So that I have the right to put my lights on anytime I want to. Well, he has a point. But friends, no soldier in the Second World War, far from home, far from his family, lonely, living under the constant threat of death, cold, dirty, hungry, was saying to himself or herself, I'm so glad I'm here because it means 75 years from now someone can happily display their Christmas lights on November the 1st. If that's all freedom is about for you, the ability to put your lights up whenever you want to, then I think you've missed the point. Your road marked freedom too is going to prove to be a dead end. Freedom is about so much more than that. Here is my point, and it's a very simple one. We are living in uncertain times, and as a result, the bubble of our invincibility has been removed. We are seeing the world in a way that we may never have seen it before, and many of us are feeling quite vulnerable. Again, that's why parallels are drawn between COVID-19 and war. It's not a war, but it's the closest thing that folks in my generation, your generation, have come to understand that there are global threats beyond our control. But could it be that we are being given in this, 
in the midst of this an opportunity, a gift even, the gift of reality, the gift of awareness, a gift that allows ourselves to ask this vital question, what does my freedom mean to me and how am I prepared to use it? Am I going to use it to bury my head in the sand in the hopes that all these problems will go away? Am I going to blissfully put up my Christmas lights despite the scowling neighbor across the street? Or does freedom mean more than that? Maybe this day, Remembrance Sunday 2020, is the day when we finally say to ourselves, I'm going to use my freedom to be part of the solution. I'm going to use my freedom to willingly sacrifice some of my privilege to help another. I'm going to use my freedom to start taking climate change really seriously and start changing how I live and how I use my resources. I'm going to use my freedom to work hard for a cause for justice because when I lift up another, I lift up myself. When I better my world, I better the world. So I am going to use my freedom boldly and decisively. Why? Because of COVID. Because we finally understand how fragile, how fragile, how fragile is life, is our planet, is our peace, is our privilege. And like a brave soldier who walks willingly towards the threat, we can say, I will be silent no more. I will be complacent no more. I will be unaware no more. I will do what I can do to change freedom from to freedom to. Take this wonderful gift that was bought for us on the hills of Vimy, the beaches of Normandy, the trenches of Passchendaele, the skies over London, and use it in the struggles of this era so that the principles of life that truly matter, justice, fairness, compassion, and love of neighbor will never be lost on the battlefields of today. Amen.